having seen what the how the insertion sort algorithm works let's try to analyze this algorithm if you recall in a previous video we said that the most important resource that we're going to look at in this course is computational time and analyzing an algorithm is almost always going to involve predicting the amount of computational time that the algorithm is going to take and we also have to imagine running this algorithm on a random access machine so let's try to look at this pseudocode for insertion sort and imagine running this pseudocode on that generic random access machine that we talked about in a previous video the contents of so let's let's first look at what's happening inside this for loop the contents of the for loop are going to be executed how many number of times well approximately n minus 1 times okay because we start with j equal to 2 and we end with j equal to n so we'll be iterating through this loop n minus 1 times now if you remember one of the things we said about a generic random access machine is that if we look at the instruction set of that machine we said that the instruction set is going to have uh, all the typical operations that you find uh, in a real machine you know arithmetic instructions branch instructions load and store instructions procedure calls and so on but we also said that we are going to imagine each of those instructions as being executed in a constant amount of time maybe a different constant for each of the instructions but nevertheless constant uh, they're going to execute in a constant amount of time now if you look at each of these individual statements let's let's take this statement x equal to a of j when a compiler translates this instruction into assembly language what's going to happen is that we're going to have from this one statement we're going to have you know a few assembly language instructions generated okay we don't know how exactly how many exactly but uh, we know that it's going to be some small number of instructions likewise if we look at this example or this line index equal to j minus one well you're going to you know in assembly language, we'll need to do a subtract operation, and then we'll need to assign the result of that subtraction to this variable. Here, we need to calculate uh, what the address of this element is going to be a of j. For that, we'll use the address of the first element of the array, and then to that address, we'll add um, j multiplied by, you know, whatever is the memory requirement of each individual element of the array and uh, we are going to then thereby arrive at the address of a of j and then we're going to have a, a load operation which will uh, access memory at that address load it load the contents of that memory um, into a register and then you know uh, we're going to assign it to this variable so basically we each of these instructions each of these lines is going to translate into a constant number of assembly language instructions and we also know that each of these assembly language instructions is going to run in a constant amount of time so the amount of time that it takes to execute this instruction on a random access machine is going to be some constant let me use a different color here uh, it's going to be some constant which I'll call as C1 likewise the amount of time it takes to execute this line is going to be some constant which I'm going to call as C2 but actually let me call this as C2 and C3 because 
executing uh, this this particular line is also going to take some time because uh, you know we implicitly we are implying that uh, j is going to be incremented by one. Firstly, it's going to be assigned to two, and then it's going to be incremented by one every time we run the for loop. And then we also want to check whether after incrementing j whether we have crossed uh, the value of n or not. So those uh, doing all that is going to take a few assembly language instructions but nonetheless the time is going to be some constant. So um, let me just call it c1. I'm going to call this as c2. This is c3. This is a slightly more complex instruction but you know, uh, executing it won't take more than a constant amount of time again because you'll have a constant number of assembly language instructions when you translate this into assembly language and each of those is going to take a constant amount of time. So likewise this is going to, this is going to take uh, C5 units of time, this is going to take C6 units of time and this is going to take C7 units of time. Now what is the total amount of time that will be taken to execute this uh, algorithm? Well notice that because the, all these instructions are present inside the body of the for loop, they're going to be executed over and over. In particular, because the for loop runs n minus 1 times, these statements are going to be executed n minus 1 times. So the amount of time that it's going to take will be n minus 1 multiplied by the time it takes to run the body of the for loop. I'm assuming that C1 is also incorporated within this because clearly C1 is also going to be executed approximately n minus 1 or n times um, because the counter needs to be incremented from 2 all the way up to n or n plus 1 uh, before we stop the for loop. So The other thing that we need to note over here is this while loop because the instructions within the while loop are, are going to be executed more than once in general because this while loop is going to be executed how many number of times? Well every time we find an element while scanning to the left starting from a of j minus 1 every time we find an element that is greater than x we're going to keep executing the body of the while loop so effectively the number of times the while loop is going to be executed is going to be the number of elements over here that are greater than x okay so it's the size of uh, this portion of the sorted uh, sequence until we hit this boundary so in general let's let's say that uh, the length of this is going to be let's call this t sub j. Know that it's going to depend on j because every time we try to insert a new element the length of this portion is going to vary. Sometimes the while loop may exit before even uh, you know it may exit immediately without even running its body once. If we, we saw that in the example we took in the last video where you know sometimes we had to we had to go all the way uh, to the left end of the sorted uh, array sometimes we ex exited the while loop right at the beginning so, and other times we, we we exited somewhere in the middle so this t sub j is going to depend on j and every time we run this for loop the value of t of j is going to be different. So the body of the while loop is going to be executed t of j number of times. And so you can say that um, within for, for a particular value of j for a particular value of j the total amount of time that is going to be taken by this while loop will be the sum of these three constants multiplied by t of j. So it will be, you know, some constant, um, let me call this uh, k1 multiplied by t of j. Okay, and, and it's obviously going to depend 
uh, on J. If you look at the other instructions over here, uh, C1, C2, C3, and C7, these are going to be executed approximately n minus 1 times. And of course, this K1 multiplied by Tj is also going to be executed n minus 1 times because everything is finally inside the for loop. So, if we try to write an expression for the running time of uh, this algorithm, it's going to be, you know, C1 plus C2 plus C3 plus C7 multiplied by n minus 1 plus K1 times Tj multiplied by n minus 1. Okay, that's roughly what it's going to look like. So let me write it as C1 plus C2 plus C3 plus C7 multiplied by n minus 1 plus K1 times Tj multiplied by n minus 1. And maybe we can call this, uh, we can call C1 plus C2 plus C3 plus C7 as some other constant K2. So you can see that uh, in general it's going to be some constant multiplied by n minus 1 plus some other constant multiplied by n minus 1 multiplied by t of j. Now depending on depending on what t of j is the value of this expression can be very different. In the worst case, in the worst case, what would be the value of, uh, sorry, actually this, this is not k1 times t of j multiplied by n minus 1 because we can multiply it by n minus 1 only if t of j was a constant. But because t of j is variable, so let me, let me write it down again. going to be C1 plus C2 plus C1 plus C2 plus C3 plus C7 multiplied by n minus 1. So these are constants. So every time we run the for loop, they're going to take the same amount of time and the for loop runs n minus 1 times. So the contribution of those statements to the time computational time is this expression. But if you look at k1 multiplied by t of j, this is going to vary every time we run the for loop. Right? So the for loop runs n minus 1 times and every time we run the for loop the value of t of j may be different. So the contribution of these statements is going to be a summation from j equal to 2 to n. Okay, initially I wrote it as k1 times tj multiplied by n minus 1, which is actually not right because t of j is not a constant, so uh, we can't just multiply it by n minus 1. But rather we'll have n minus 1 terms, each with their own values for t of j. And so the contribution of uh, the while loop to the computational time is going to be the summation of those times. Now k1 of course can be pulled out, so let me write it as k1. Now, this is, we can say, the time, the computational time that it's going to take to run this algorithm. Now, one of the things that you can note here is that the running time or the computational time depends on the input size. That's not surprising because, um, firstly, what is the input size over here? The input size here is n. So the input size here is simply the length of the array, length of the input array. Because this the, uh, the unordered sequence that's given to us has a length of n. The size of the input is taken to be n. So this is the parameter and the running time is going to depend on what the length of the array is. And clearly the longer the input array, 
the longer the running, the larger the running time. And you can see this here because as n grows large, this expression is going to grow, grow large. And in general, this is also going to grow large because this is a summation from j equal to 2 to n. And if n grows, then this summation is also going to grow. So it depends on n. That's, uh, that's one observation. The other observation is that the running time depends on the type of input. What do I mean by the type of input? Well, depending on what, so let's let's just take, let's just consider all possible inputs or different inputs of size n. Okay. Now for different instances of the input of size n, the values of t sub j may be different. If you go back to this pseudocode and furthermore to this uh, visual uh, execution of the insertion sort algorithm. You may note that if the input array had, or had been sorted at the beginning itself, so let's say the, the input array that was given to you of size n was already sorted, how much time would insertion sort have taken in that case? Well, this while loop would have immediately exited because every time you try to add a new element to the sorted portion, that element would have been greater than all the elements in the sorted portion. And so the size of t of j there would have been zero because all the elements would have been less than or equal to the element that you are trying to insert. So the while loop then wouldn't have executed even once. But on the other hand, if the input had been reverse sorted, then the, the then every time you tried to insert a new element, it would have turned out to be smaller than all the elements in this sorted portion. What that means is all these elements in the sorted portion would have been greater than or equal to x, the element that you're trying to insert. So the size of so, so this would have been equal to, the, the length of this portion would have been equal to 0 and the length of t of j would have been simply equal to j minus 1 because then you would have had to execute the while loop j minus 1 times. You would have continued shifting the elements to the right all the way till you hit the left boundary. So you can see that depending on whether the input was sorted or reverse